Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research as well as Israeli News Live. This will actually probably be airing in both platforms. And um, this is going to be a pretty in-depth message, but it's also, not, I don't want to call it doctrinal. We're, we're going to be examining multiple passages. And, and in fact, I guess the premise is going to kind of hang around Malachi. Uh, I think in the, in the, in the King James Version, this would be Malachi 4. In fact, I'll pull that up for you just so we have it there as well. Uh, doesn't the, the Hebrew is really not as, as critical. It's chapter 3 if you have a Hebrew Bible. Um, and <clears throat> specifically, we're going to be looking at where, where God says, Behold, I will send you uh, Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And... What got me into this is this because Jesus alludes to this particular verse, at least it's the only verse I can find in the Old Testament that he would allude to, when speaking over in the book of Matthew, uh, and, and we were looking, um, oh boy, there's so many things I have, and I, I may have already, yeah, I think I already changed it. Let me go back over here. I think it's Matthew chapter, um, let me just look real quick here. Oh, goodness. Okay, yeah, Matthew, well, I think we were in the right chapter. Maybe it is chapter 11. Yeah, chapter 11. Going to be looking at this from the Hebrew Matthew specifically because the wording in the Hebrew is far more interesting than in the Greek language. <clears throat> As a result of this, so I, you know, what Jesus says here took me to Malachi chapter 4 because I, it's the only place, like I said, I can find that he alludes to this coming of the uh, uh, a dreadful day, and uh, <clears throat> and there's so many things that I've stumbled across in doing this study that I figured I would just share it with you like an like an open book, so to speak. Here, just let you <clears throat> share with you my thoughts, but I don't consider them doctrinal thoughts. Uh, we will be looking at some writings that are not biblical that, uh, again, I don't want you taking them as biblical, just that uh, we look at it as reference, historic reference uh, material in light of this. A lot of this, so I'm going back to the book of Exodus, Deuteronomy, <clears throat> and uh, even Joshua, and I wanted to point out some very interesting thoughts that I had on this, and, and just see how you take it, you know, just see what see what your thoughts are on it, you know? I, I, don't, I don't necessarily have all the answers, so... Let me, let me take you to what got me started on this. And I was actually just following up. Um, we were with uh, June Knight recently, and Yana was quoting from a scripture in Matthew. I think it was actually chapter 9. But then I just decided to keep on reading <clears throat> through, uh, through Matthew at the time when after we'd got finished with that little message there. And I get to Matthew 11, and... Uh, as I was reading here, and we'll start with verse 9. If so, uh, excuse, let me back up. It's, it's talking about Jesus, talking about John the Baptist. He goes, it came to pass as they were going that Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. <clears throat> you went out into the wilderness to see what? Now I'm reading from the Hebrew Matthew right here. Uh, um, George Howard's version of that. A reed cast about by the wind, he says. Or what did you go out to see? Do you think that John was a man clothed in noble garments? Behold, those who wear noble garments are in king's houses. If so, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Truly I say to you that this one is greater than a prophet. This is he about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will make the way clear before me. Now, I'm going to pause there just for a moment. He's reading clearly from Malachi chapter 3 in that case there. All right, let's back up. Uh, King James separates those last, uh, I think, five or six verses there from the Hebrew text, which is just chapter 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But 
who may be able to abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi, purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Oh boy, he, did he ever do some refining of, of, of that group when he was here, right? So Jesus clearly identifies that John is fulfilling that particular mission. So let's go back here again to the Hebrew, Matthew. And um, we'll begin a, back with verse 9. If so, what did you go out to see? A prophet? <clears throat> he asked. Truly I say to you that this one is greater than a prophet. This is he about whom it is written, Behold, I am sending my messenger, and he will make the way clear before me. Again, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, among all those born of women, none has risen greater than John the baptizer. From his day, this is where it gets interesting, from his days until now, the kingdom of heaven has been oppressed and senseless persons have been rending it. That, I don't want you to forget that one right there because that really caught my attention as well. The kingdom of heaven has been oppressed. Now, in the King James Version, let's take a look at that. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven? Suffering violence and the violent take it by force? Well, we know this is not where the Father resides, but there is no doubt during the time when Jesus was here on earth, he's clearly identifying that while John's, from the beginning of John. Until that very moment, the kingdom of heaven was in a turmoil. So something was going on, whether it be above our head or another dimension, there was a battle going on, major battle that was taking place. Then he goes on to say, For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which is the Greek form for Elijah, which was for to come. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, oddly enough, in that chapter, it's the only time where he says, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. So it is clearly a mystery that Jesus is conveying here, and he's looking to see if you can get it. In other words, do you have the spiritual insight to know what he's really talking about? But, why did I bring this up? When we read this here, it appears to be in Greek that Jesus is saying that Elijah, uh, or that John was the prophesied Elijah that was going to come, and thus he fulfilled this prophecy. I remember when I studied this as much as I could, because I don't know Greek, but as much as I could, it still carried a future tense as if it was not fulfilled. Jesus does accredit John to fulfilling, um, Behold, I send my messenger before my face. Right there. And verse 10, he clearly identifies John as fulfilling that passage while he's here on the earth. But when we get down here, it seems to be a little different, but most people would say, well, gosh, no, no. He's just saying that John was the fulfillment of the prophecy of Elias, which was for to come, right? And the only place that we would have would be Malachi's prophecy, Okay, and that's where he says, um, let me find the right place here. Oh, we're in chapter 3 again, so let me change it to chapter 4. 
Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Oddly enough, he says before that, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. And then he goes, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, Elijah had already come. Malachi, when he's prophesying, Elijah had already come. He's taken up in the chariot of, chariots of fire there. He goes up, doesn't see death. And of course, we get, uh, there's so many people that say, oh, he's got to come back and die. Because the scripture says it's important to once, once for man to die and after this, the judgment. I have taught that so many times till I'm probably blue in the face at this point there. Uh, that is speaking specifically of Jesus and him appointed once for death to take away the sins of the world. Nothing to do with John's got to come back or Elijah's got to come back and die. All right. In light of this, though, I want to go back to the Hebrew Matthew because this is what's going to kind of send us down a very interesting trail here. He said, If so, what did you go out to see a prophet? Truly, I say to you, this one is greater than a prophet. This is, then he goes, This is he about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger, and, and he will make the way clear before me. Now he's putting, he puts that in the present tense. Again, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I said to you, among all those born of women, none has been arisen greater than John the baptizer. From his days until now, the kingdom of heaven has been oppressed, and senseless persons have been rending it. Or, as we read in the Greek version there, it is suffering violence, and the violent are the ones that are doing it. So something also, he's not just talking about John the Baptist, but he's also telling you that a, a tremendous battle has taken place in the heavens. Then we go into verse 13. For all the prophets in the law spoke concerning John. That's interesting. For all the prophets and the law spoke concerning John. Now, if you hold that, Verse 13, and again, we'll look at it over here in the Greek. For all the prophets and law prophesied until John. That's an interesting point. The Greek says it prophesied until John, but the Hebrew Matthew says, For all the prophets and law spoke concerning John. Shachal, Hanavim, Ha Torah. Debohu al Yochanan. Okay. All okay, so it says here Shechol, which is uh, that which all the prophets, Hanavim, Veha Torah, and the law or the Torah spoke of him al Yochanan. That makes it different. That literally makes the prophet that makes the words of Jesus a little different than what we have over in the Greek. And I'm not here to lift one above the other. We know according to the church fathers, Matthew did write in the Hebrew language. So there is that indication that something could be a little different. And this one here says, For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And basically, we're reading in the Hebrew Matthew that all the prophets in the law, basically, Debru, Debru is speak, speak of him, spoke of him, that literally means spoke of him, not just Deber, it's not Dalet Bet Resh, it's Dalet Bet Resh Vav, which is that spoke of him. Be'ochanan, or I don't know if it's Be'ochanan or not, but it's Yochanan at least, you know, speaking about John. Uh, oh, al, uh, about, al, is even more better than Be. So, al Yochanan. All right? So, we have that. And if you wish to receive it, Jesus goes on to say, and let's go back to the Greek version of this. Okay? Um, and... Bear with me one second here. Um, kind of have to back up here just for a second. I got my thought kind of messed up here just for a moment. If I 
force for all the prophets. They prophesied until John, and if you were see, this is the last which was for to come. He that hath an ear, all right. Let me come back over here. For all the prophets and law spoke concerning John. If you wish to receive it, he is Elijah, who is going to come. Now that's the way they put that in English. Now if you look at this in the Hebrew language, it says right here. Uh, verse 14 who he Eliyahu he is Elijah ha'atid future labo future to come then he says he who has ears to hear let him hear so there's an emphasis that he places now on that that verse right before when he says he who has ears to hear let him hear so he's not only telling you that john is the elijah that is fulfilling malachi chapter 3 at the beginning of the verse behold i prepare the my message uh, i'm the, you know per, oh, let me get it right here um he's not only uh saying that he is the uh, Elijah of Malachi 3 which is behold I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me but now Jesus is saying to you if you can receive it if you can receive it if you have ears to hear let him hear if you have the ability to understand the revelation of what he's speaking about now he is telling you clearly as plain as you can in the Hebrew Matthew he is the Elijah who is in the future. That literally, that word, you can't even translate ha atid any other way than the word future. He is the Elijah, the future. And it literally uses the, the, the definite article hey uh, in front of that. And let me just see if I can highlight that for you so you can see. There you go. There, that's it right there. Ha atid. He is the Elijah, the future to come. So even though John the Baptist is already, I believe at that point there, he had already he was already beheaded by that time. Not only did Jesus tell you that he was the messenger that was going to prepare the way, but now he is telling you that he is that Elijah that is going to still come yet in the future. Which continues down into Malachi. We get into Malachi a little further and that's when we get into chapter 4. And then he says, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded it to him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet. Before what? The coming of the great, and literally that is the evil day of the Lord. Dreadful, we translate dreadful, but it is the evil day of the Lord. So that we have to go here because Jesus sources Malachi 3 verse 1 and he then he later as he's going on then he sources again if you can receive it he will be that Elijah that's coming in the future and that Elijah is coming right before a destruction from the Almighty or from the Lord in this case here right Yehovah as we would say that now I began to also look at some of the similarities here because he mentions Moses, his servant, and Mount Horeb. Now, those of you that remember, when Moses goes, I believe it's in the book of Deuteronomy here. I'll just quickly just skim over there. The Lord God spoke unto us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough in this mountain. That was after 40 years in the wilderness. Not only that, when Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments, he's what, 40 days and nights up on the mountain. Elijah travels and literally goes there. And this is, like I said, now we're going to get into some things. That, like I said, I, I don't make it a doctrine. I just want you to think about it because it's just fascinating to me. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meal 
40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. Now, I find it fascinating that God says to Moses, not, yeah, the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. Something about Horeb and him going to that cave, I think, is far different than what we perhaps are thinking. And I say that because Elijah, he's used to traveling in the desert. You don't think Elijah doesn't know how to walk through the desert? He does it all the time. Why is it that God has to give Elijah a special meal, an, a, a heavenly meal, so powerful that it's going to give him the strength to make a journey? And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord come to him. And he said unto him, what do you, uh, what do us, uh, what, what are you doing uh, here, Elijah? <laughs> now God knows he's going there. Now, now he asked him why he's there. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars and slain your prophets with the sword, and I even I am, am left alone, and they seek my life to take it away as well. Maybe, and I, actually I spoke on this not long ago about uh, Malachi 4 and, and, and the whole issue about God referring to Moses and the, and, and the law before he says about Elijah. And of course the question could arise, is this your two witnesses? A lot of debates on that. Uh, I'm not really here to focus on that issue here other than what we're doing now is we're looking at this to say that Malachi 4 does take us to verse 4, remember you the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him into Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and the judgments. Now he tells you to remember that. So if I'm going to remember it, I want to go back and remember it. What happened? Like I said, Deuteronomy. God gave him the Ten Commandments. He's there 40 days, 40 nights, just like Elijah. First Kings, we find out Elijah goes there. He's also, he's in the cave 40 days, 40 nights. And he's discussing the fact that the children of Israel have what? Forgotten the law. What did, what did God say in Malachi 4? Remember my servant Moses. He doesn't say anything about remember the covenant and the statutes. He just said, remember my servant Moses. Then he goes on, verse 11. He said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by a great and strong wind rent the mountain and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind and the earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Now, I'm sitting watching the curtain move in behind me, and I'm like, who in the world's in the room? It's the dog. Okay. My little dog was under there. I'm like, there's nobody big enough to get in there. But anyway, got it. All right. Now, if you notice that still small voice, right? Remember what Jesus said right after he quotes this to about Eli the coming of Elijah? He is the Elijah who is in the future to come. Then he goes, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. I can't help but think that there's your still small voice. Christ speaking to his beloved trying to get us to wake up to something that's going on, right? Beautiful, 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 if you ask me. So, and it was so when Elijah heard it that he, that he wrapped his face in his mantle, he went out and stood in the entrance of the cave, and behold, there came a voice unto him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Right? We read all this on here. So, 
I find the fascination of the similarities and, and the timing. I, I don't know specifically what does it mean. Have no idea. Now, let me just see. I've got several other places here. Let me just look at the, see if I can see why I put these in here. Uh, of course, they had been there long enough. God moves them off of the mountain. Uh, yeah, this is where this is. We are in um, Deuteronomy 4. This, again, is all about Mount Horeb. Uh, you came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire into the heart of heaven and with darkness and cloud and a thick darkness, etc. Now, the other thing is that I find fascinating about this time of the wilderness journey, etc., uh, that we have, and even where God meets Moses at the burning mount, uh, things of that, uh, of, of this, this information as well, is that if you read from the Colbrin, uh, it is a historical documentation of the Exodus as well. Uh, the authenticity, I cannot verify the, 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 uh, the accuracy of the historical documentation. I'm not aware of either. But it is very interesting, though, in light of the fact that, yes, it speaks about the Pharaoh of Egypt. Yes, one of their own uh, spiritual leaders led the, as they call them, slaves out of Egypt. They do cross the Red Sea. And everything that is written in there likens those events that were happening in the days of Moses uh, and Aaron when he was sent down there to deliver the children of Israel is typed and, and shown as a result of what we call Planet X. They call it the destroyer that happened during the Andalusian destruction that brought about the flood upon the earth. They say it also happened during the time when Moses delivered the children of Israel out of Egypt. And so, therefore, everything that, that takes place uh, seems to be of an interest in, in light of the historical documentation that they're putting down for this, although it is different from ours biblically a little bit. Not a lot. I mean, yes, we do have the hailstones. Yes, we do have the, the disease and the famine. And yes, we do have the pestilence that come up out of the ground. Uh, we have all those things that are happening. Now, one thing that they do mention in, in their writing is that this, that the, um, that Egypt had been forsaken by both the gods above in heaven and the gods beneath in the earth or the abyss. And I can believe that because the Egyptians were very much into all kinds of idolatry. So I don't doubt that they were forsaken by both. And it appears to be their gods are fallen angel gods, so to speak. And one particular, I think it's al Kanan, is mentioned. And this guy here, when it speaks about him, he comes to overtake Egypt, destroy Egypt, because it says that where he is coming from, their land had been destroyed as well. Uh, they had the frogs, and it says the or reptiles, it says, and the ants, the invasion that happened within there. And I cannot help but wonder if he wasn't from the inner earth is where he was, uh, where he came from. Could be wrong on that completely. It might have just been the Far East where he comes and he conquers Egypt. I'm not really sure. But nonetheless, all this information I find, found very interesting, which brought me to a new thought as well that I w was sharing actually over with Dave Hodges on the Common Sense Show. I was over there with him the other day. Uh, and that is, when we look at the Exodus story, I have often wondered, too, that God, in preserving the children of Israel, not only did he have to deliver them from the hand of, uh, of Pharaoh, but it was also for the preserving of their lives so they did not die. Uh, now, granted, they were blessed in a part of the country that was not getting hit by the hailstones, etc. We know that. Uh, so, but... Even when they come out and they're, and, and they're fed with manna and they wander in the wilderness journey over there in what we'd call modern day Saudi Arabia, could it be that God had, it wasn't just the fact that they were wandering there, but giving the time for the land to heal from all the devastation that had plummeted the earth? I don't know the answer to that. But it's just made me wonder, especially in light of the fact that we know, according to the scripture, let me just see if I have that in the have that in the right place there. Um, waters were the great deep. Let's see for the for the. Uh, 
hang on I got it in here somewhere and I don't want to lose it here uh, we are I'm looking for the scripture there and maybe it was in Isaiah let me go back I think we're in Isaiah 51 if I'm yeah Isaiah 51 uh, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look upon the earth and beneath for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment boy we got some that's another prophecy of things that are coming right um, and but what I'm looking for and I can just relate it you guys already know the scripture on it anyway maybe it's in Joshua let's see for Moses had given the inheritance of the two tribes and the half tribe beyond the Jordan that's not the one either oh goodness i did so many biblical scriptures i kind of got it probably mixed up a little bit on there um there's people they're almost ready to stone me this is where also by the way also at horeb is where he smote the rock and it brought forth its waters right another beautiful analogy there i'll just i'll just cite what i was thinking about there because like i said there's so many scriptures i have up on the screen here i'll never get it all out but the fact is the scripture says that their shoes did not wear out their clothes did not wear out uh caleb i think was i think he was caleb was 40 years old when they went to spy out, or when they left egypt and here he is at 80 or, or 45 i think he was and at 85 years old he is saying as they're going into the promised land that his strength never obe uh, never abated. He was still able to war at 85 years old as if he was a young man. Uh, Moses too, we read about Moses at 120 years old. He too had not seemed to age whatsoever during this 40 year wilderness journey. So my thought has been, was there something about the manna that really helped to preserve their life in a way that was beyond that of the natural? Just like in the case with Elijah, before he goes down to Mount Horeb, God appears and gives him this cake that's going to take him for 40 days because the way he was going, as he said to him, was very difficult. And again, like I said, I, I can't help but wonder, he was going somewhere that wasn't normal, in my opinion. Uh, Some place that we may be overlooking scripturally. But at the end of the day, what are we saying all this for in the first place? Here's the thing. Jesus is alluding to Malachi 4 of that day when Elijah is going to be sent before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. We do have in Revelation 11 where it speaks about your uh, two witnesses. We know this. We, we're very familiar with this, this passage. And I actually have verse 12 open, um, but I'll back it up one chapter there. You know, we have... I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. We know that this is supposed to happen. Many people have believed the two witnesses to be Moses and Elijah based on the gifts that are mentioned here in the book of Revelation. But what's so critical in this case here, and is mainly only speaking of Elijah, because the, the debate comes as far as Moses. Well, Moses died. Moses doesn't have to die. Enoch has not died. Enoch's got to come back which, like I said, I've dealt with that so many times. That's such a misinterpreted scripture. It's not even funny. But nonetheless, it doesn't matter to me who comes. I don't really, uh, I'm not worried about that. But the fact that Jesus clearly tells us that John is the Elijah who is coming in the future, the Hebrew, uh, Ha'atid. And in fact, I will see if I can't, just, just to give you even from modern uh, Hebrew there, let me let me just show you something here. Uh, I mean, and don't necessarily use Google Translate as a thumbnail for being able to uh, translate uh, biblical documents. It's it, it's not it's not good for that. All right, it's just so you know that. All right, so let's keep ha atid okay tav yod dalit. There you go, right there. And the it's the word future, like I mentioned to you for our future tense, but it is future. Uh, no other way to translate it. You can take off the hey, and you still got future. Why? Because the hey is a definite article, so that really puts the emphasis emphasis on the word. Uh, atid. Atid is the root of the word that we're looking at here. So when Jesus says there that who, which is he. That's right there. Who, who, Eliyahu, 
he, Elijah, all right, he's saying that he is Elijah, specifically, ha-atid, in the future to come, okay? He is that Elijah for the future to come. And, uh, and when he cites that, he's letting you know you're looking for that future Elijah to come. That's why he says, he that has ears to hear, let him hear. So, and I don't, you know, just like, now here's the interesting thing too. J Jesus clearly identifies too. John didn't come out in king's clothes. He wasn't fancy. He wasn't anybody you should expect to see. So why would we expect anything different? Right? Uh, and the only thing I can figure is that he will send the Elijah, as Jesus even clearly identifies here too, right before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So, is that, uh, it appears to be Revelation 11 as well. In my opinion, I really believe it is Revelation 11. But, uh, but it just, just, really just fascinating. And I wanted to share that with you guys. Anyway, God bless you. Thank you for listening. Stephen Bernoon here with Israeli News Live.